The next problem that we have to solve, now that we've learned about the LZW scheme, is a practical one. How do we go from the clever tricks we saw in the last lecture to an actual bit stream of compressed data? And furthermore, how do we go from a bunch of bits, that is to say the bit stream, to a bunch of bytes that we can store on disk or send over a network or whatever? Because we know that most modern architectures work in terms of bytes and not bits. And while we can implement data structures that work with bits, usually when I want to store data or export it from my program or the context of an algorithm, I need it to be in byte form. And we're going to use this opportunity to explore a few things that I've foreshadowed pretty heavily in the last couple of lectures uh, in a lot more detail. And the biggest one is this constant tension that we're going to experience in this course between having our clever tricks, so we've got the LZW scheme in a sense sort of on paper already defined. Now in the last lecture we were talking about things like using 9 bits per symbol, uh, which means we do know a little bit about how we're going to represent it um, once it gets time to implement. But in a sense we've covered it sort of theoretically. So we've got that, but on the other hand what we want is a bit stream an actual bit stream of actual bits, not just an abstract discussion of, oh, we could represent this in nine bits. Show me the bits. I want to see them. I want to see how you're turning them into bytes. Um, and so I want to discuss that, obviously, um, and I'm going to do so in the context of this ancient Unix program called Compress. Now, Compress wasn't the very first compression tool for Unix platforms. Arguably, it wasn't even the very first one that saw some degree of widespread use. But I believe that it was the first one that was, uh, became sort of ubiquitous. It became something you could expect uh, somebody else with a Unix machine to have on hand. So you could send them a compressed file use, that was compressed with this program, and you could reasonably expect that they could figure out how to decompress it. It was, it was the first one to become widespread in that sense. Uh, and we can see that in the sense of it has this name, this generic looking name, compress, as opposed to something more specific which is a bit of a pain because it means when I begin talking about it, I can't just say the compress program because that could mean just about anything in this course. Before I talk more about that, I want to explore further this tension, which you could argue is sort of tension between theory and practice. And I'm going to do it through the lens of something that might be more familiar to you, which is analysis of algorithms. So let's consider um, multiplying together two matrices. And uh, this is a problem that you've probably seen before in lots of different settings. Odds are, in a first year course, you were asked to write code to do this. You certainly were if you were in my first year course. I just can't resist. So if I give you two matrices that are n by n, and I say write some nested loops to compute their product, um, so with matrix multiplication, well, then probably in your first year course, the algorithm that you wrote had running time n cubed. So it was probably three nested loops, which is nice. I think that's a very nice, elegant algorithm, and it tends to be the case, not that we would care about this too much in a first year course, it tends to be the case that compilers, when they see those three nested loops, are pretty good at figuring out how to optimize them. Okay, so, and obviously if you took an algorithms course, which I, you did because you're in this course, if you took an algorithms course after that, you would know how to analyze those three nested loops, figure out that they're big O of n cubed, and even if you have clever tricks that you can use to avoid a few operations here or there, that strategy pretty much gives you n cubed one way or the other. And you also know from an algorithms course that we often measure the performance of algorithms in this asymptotic notation, and we often decide whether to use a particular algorithm based on um, its asymptotic complexity. And we know that that means that big O of n cubed isn't as good as big O of n squared, or big O of n. And that results in some of us developing a certain bias, which is that if somebody hands us an algorithm that's big O of n and not big O of n cubed, we want to choose this one. We say, well, that algorithm is better. Now, if you took CSC 225 with me, you would discover that I am just as much of a perpetrator of that um, line of thinking as anybody else. I think that in general, choosing algorithms based on asymptotic complexity is a good idea, as long as you know exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. So asymptotic complexity is great because it allows us to measure uh, the performance of an algorithm in a sort of input size agnostic way. 
Uh, and that's a way of considering the fact that in computer science, and this has been the case forever, but arguably these days, if you watch the escalation of things like AI over the past couple of years, I think it, it really hits home. In computer science, things have always been growing almost exponentially. So our inputs that we tend to work with, that we're able to work with on a modern computer today in 2023, as I record this, are way larger than they were the last time I taught this course in 2020, or five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or whatever. So if we're deciding how to design some large piece of software that involves algorithms, choosing algorithms based on asymptotic complexity makes a lot of sense, assuming that our software is designed to work with inputs of any size Size, as size tends to increase over time due to the increase in the availability of computing resources. Okay, whatever. I love asymptotic notation. I think it's great to choose algorithms by their asymptotic complexity. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that a big O of n algorithm is always better than a big O of n cubed algorithm. Because it could be that in the context in which you are working, you don't necessarily see absolutely massive inputs, nor do you expect to. And even if you're choosing it in the usual proactive sense of, hey, I'm going to choose a big O n algorithm because I don't know whether in 20 years my software will still be in use on way, way larger inputs. Even if you do that, you have to be a little bit careful because the scale of input you might need to make a particular big O n algorithm actually faster, so faster faster in terms of looking at the clock as opposed to performing asymptotic analysis could be such a massive input that it's unlikely that anybody would ever use such an input on your program until long after somebody would reasonably have just rewritten your program. So you've probably seen the basic n-cubed algorithm for multiplying matrices, which I guess I have to call the naive algorithm because of a certain sense that we have in computer science that if an, if an answer seems obvious that you shouldn't be given any credit for coming up with it, I guess. On the other hand, it turns out, and many of you may have seen this, in fact, in a, uh, an algorithm analysis course at some point, so CSE 225, CSE 226, maybe CSE 425, um, there are algorithms to multiply matrices together that have better running times. So this is actually not the fastest one, but an example of a faster one is the coppersmith winograd algorithm, which has a running time that's definitely not n-cubed. It's n to the power of 2.3 something. And if you stare at that, just as an aside, if you stare at that, you know, as you may recall from an earlier course, when you begin looking at exponents that are this strange decimal expansion, odds are that's the result of trying to convert some kind of logarithm or something to a decimal expansion and approximate it. So that, that expansion probably could go on for a while. And it very likely is the result of doing something like solving a recurrence relation. That's probably where that came from. So it's not like the authors sat down and were able to write 2.374 in nested loops. Odds are there's some kind of recurrence of stuff happening behind the scenes. Whatever, it's n to the 2.374. Definitely in the context of asymptotic analysis, that's way better than n cubed. I should also add, I mean, I, I might as well throw this in. Whenever I talk about asymptotic analysis and algorithms course, I'd rather use big theta than big O, but to be magnanimous, some of you only know about big O. So whatever, but I use big theta for this. In any case, uh, n to the 2.374 is better than n cubed. Um, the problem with that, though, is that asymptotic analysis, as, as you know, when you use asymptotic notation, when I say something is big O of n squared, I could be referring to an algorithm that requires on, let's say, the machine that I'm currently using to record this, five n squared uh, operations, five n squared instructions, for example, or I could be referring to something that requires 10 to the 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 5 n squared operations. Because this number here is a constant. It's a relatively large constant, uh, but it's a constant. And that means that an algorithm with this running time is still big O of n squared, as you know from probably the second week of a course in asymptotic that requires asymptotic analysis. The problem with the Compersmith Winograd algorithm is that it has such a massive constant in front of it, and you can be the judge yourself, maybe an exercise for the reader or for the viewer is to figure out if it's as big as this constant, probably not. Um, the Compersmith Winograd algorithm has such a massive constant in front of it that to actually realize a speed improvement, so the inputs that the Coppersmith Winograd algorithm is likely to process faster in terms of looking at the clock um, than the NQ cubed algorithm are so incredibly massive that it's basically impossible that you would ever be able to see that um, advantage in practice today. 
Now, you could be able to see it in five years or 10 years, for all I know, given how fast resources are improving. But that's one reason why if you had to sit down and choose an algorithm for matrix multiplication today, because you wanted to get something done, that is, if you're running some large um, high performance computing job and you want the answer to come out sometime soon, you would choose the n cubed algorithm. Even though, yes, in theory, the coppersmith Winograd algorithm is faster, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna see that advantage in practice. Practice. Now, we're going to come back to various versions of this dilemma a lot in this course, most of which basically funnel back into the case I've been referring to over the past couple of lectures, which is it's one thing to come up with something on paper that seems to produce good compression. But I don't believe you until you show me good compression, show me a sequence of bytes, show me a program that does it. Uh, and that means often you have to compromise what seems like a good idea on paper and produce a sort of watered down version to achieve compression in practice. It also means that some things that seem like bad ideas on paper that don't necessarily um, seem like fruitful avenues to achieve compression can end up being great. And we're going to see a few of those cases in this course as well. So, just because we have these ways of analyzing schemes based on best case or worst case or average case scenarios um, doesn't necessarily give, give us the traction that we want in a lot of cases. So to be clear, there will eventually come a point if computing advances the way it's been advancing over the past few decades, there will eventually come a point where people will be using, I guess, algorithms like the coppersmith Winograd algorithm or its successors to multiply matrices. But we're not there yet and we won't be there for an incredibly long time at the rate things are going. And we certainly won't be there on desktop computers for long enough that we probably shouldn't worry about implementing the coppersmith Winograd algorithm. Now, algorithms like that have plenty of other uses, strangely, besides somebody writing code to implement them, which is to say, in a theoretical context, it's actually quite important that we can figure out um, what the actual complexity of a task is in terms of the fastest possible algorithm asymptotically. Whether or not we use that algorithm is a secondary concern in a lot of contexts, not necessarily in this course, and it's maybe certainly not in this course. Uh, in a similar vein to that, and there's a whole, there's a whole um, rabbit hole you can go down with this, and I think the last time I taught this course I even showed, there's a Wikipedia article you can read about what are called galactic algorithms. And I, in the last video I recorded about this, I actually uh, showed the Wikipedia article. I'm going to trust viewers in 2023 to be able to go look that up on Wikipedia themselves. If I go look something up on Wikipedia in a video, I'm going to get distracted and I'm going to spend four hours reading Wikipedia. So um, galactic algorithms, according to Wikipedia, are algorithms that are apparently fast on paper or by some measure, but are completely impractical by modern standards and not likely to become practical soon. One other sort of bizarre, really extreme example is if you want to multiply to n-bit binary values, which you do if you are, for example, a hardware engineer designing a processor, you want to find some way of multiplying to n-bit values reasonably quickly using things like addition or other operations that you might have. It turns out that the asymptotically best known algorithm to do that um, is faster asymptotically than the algorithms you might use if you're designing a processor these days, but it's so complicated that you probably wouldn't want to use it. You'd negate any possible advantage because it requires apparently a 1729 dimension Fourier transform. I'm especially interested in this number, which can be expressed as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. I'm not sure why that suddenly factors into this. What an odd use of that number. Um, fair enough. I don't think I'm going to multiply two numbers using a Fourier transform if I can avoid it. And so we have the same fight in compression, which is we can come up with all sorts of clever tricks to produce compression, even LZW, and then have to temper our expectations later because of practical concerns. One example of a strange practical concern that we end up having in a course like this is we've already already observed that sometimes we use too many bits to represent symbols. If I store a sequence of input using 8 bits per symbol, so I've got in this case 24 bits worth of data here because I've got three 8-bit characters, and I observe later that I don't necessarily need 8 bits to represent this number of possibilities, maybe I can use fewer. But we saw in the first lecture the overhead we require might negate the advantage. We even discover in this course though an odd situation where suppose that there were too few possibilities need all 256. So I have 256 possibilities, but I have too few characters in my um, input to actually need all 256 8-bit sequences. Suppose though that I have 150 possible characters. Well, if I have 150 possible characters, I can't use seven bits to represent them because seven bits would only give me 128 possibilities. 
but I, so I'm sort of stuck using eight. But in an ideal world, wouldn't I be allowed to use, you know, 7.5 bits? 7.5 bits. Yeah, unfortunately, practically, bits can't be measured fractionally. I either have a bit or I don't. I either have a zero or I have a one. If I want to talk about having half of a one, well, I could go take a quantum computing course. Those are lots of fun. Um, or I could wait about four more lectures until we begin talking about ways to get a similar effect in an aggregate sense. Although fundamentally in a course where we're talking about discrete bits, the bit's either there or it isn't. And so we notice that's also a practical constraint that can sort of dampen our hopes for compression in some cases. Some compression schemes that we analyze in a theoretical sense attempt to use fractional numbers of bits, which are sometimes possible in a certain sense, but in general, that's sort of ridiculous. And so even if we can achieve this advantage on paper, I don't believe you until you show me the bits, show me the implementation that produces compression. Um, so. That's one of the reasons why I think putting your, your mind back where it was in asymptotic analysis can be helpful. We know that big O notation is a great idea. We know that asymptotic analysis of algorithms can really help us, but it's not the be-all and end-all of measuring an algorithm's performance. Um, so I also want to talk a bit about the history of LZW. So the LZW algorithm was published in 1984, and it was published by W, by Welch. The reason it's called LZW is because Welch's work was based on earlier work by L and Z, which would be Lempel and Ziv. And we'll talk a lot about Lempel and Ziv's work later in this course. And it quickly caught on as a relatively simple and fast compression scheme. And I think you can appreciate that, that now based on the previous lecture. So in the previous lecture, we saw that we can run LZW encoding pretty quickly by just running through our input sequence and maintaining a symbol table. And within the computational limits of mid-80s technology, that was easily doable. And so it was easy to write a relatively portable C program that did that, the kind of C program that you might find yourself writing in the near future, in fact, in this course. Um, and so that was implemented. One possible implementation of LZW that you could find at, at the time was this ancient Unix compress program. And as I mentioned in a previous lecture, in this course, I'm going to keep calling it the ancient Unix compress program, which is a name that I've basically made up for it because the designers of it in 1984 or 1986 or whenever the compress program was written probably wouldn't have thought at the time to call it ancient because they didn't have the level of foresight that I have. Um, but I'm going to keep calling it the ancient Unix compress program. Um, and uh, typically you can identify output of the ancient Unix compress program because it will have the extension dot uppercase Z, not dot lowercase Z. It turns out dot lowercase Z is a different primordial compression scheme that we're not going to worry so much about because it's not as interesting, although we will cover the underlying um, technique that it uses later in this course. Um, so the dot Z extension, if you ever interact for some reason with an archive of dot tar dot uppercase Z, that archive has been compressed with the ancient Unix compress program. And you may actually interact with such an archive at some point in your career. If ever you find yourself needing to look at the source code for libraries that haven't changed in 30 years, you might find that they're still distributed in archives of this form that are actually 30 years old. And so this format still exists. Modern uh, Unix compression tools and tools on other platforms still support this format because they have to, because we still need the data that people used to compress with this format. However, these days, if you want compression on a Unix platform, you shouldn't use .z because there are plenty of other schemes that are just as portable, just as ubiquitous, more ubiquitous, frankly, um, that Unix platforms support. So for example, you might use the default Plate scheme, which you which would be um, dot gz, and we'll cover that later in the course. So the compress program, the ancient Unix compress program, uses LZW with symbol sizes that increase as we go. So we saw in the last lecture that the ability to create your own symbols, so we, we use nine bits as a sort of reference point, but we could use any number of bits. The ability to add new symbols is helpful because as the algorithm progresses, it fills in a symbol table, creates all sorts of substitutions. So as we go, we create new symbols, um, for patterns that we see in our text. And that means that if I have lots of symbols available, I might be able to get more compression because the more symbols are available, the more likely it is that I can use one to save on symbols later. I can replace this, the three symbol sequence ABC with the one symbol sequence 257. So if I use nine bits for symbol, per symbol, that gives me 256 extra symbols to play with. 
If I use 10 or 11 or 12 bits, I get even more. That makes my symbol table bigger. That means there are more symbols available, and that, I guess, allows more possibilities for saving data. The problem is, as we'll see later in this lecture, the bigger your symbols are, the more you're inflating your input data stream. So the Compress tool gets around that to some extent by using symbol sizes that increase as we go. As I need more and more symbols, I make each symbol take up more and more bits to allow myself more bandwidth. Um, it, there actually are other formats that are currently in common use uh, that still use LZW, even though, as I've mentioned and as the next slides we'll talk about, there are better schemes, and there were, even in the late 1980s, better schemes than LZW in terms of actually achieving compression in practice. But formats that were developed around the heyday of LZW, some of them are still popular, and they would have used LZW at the time, and one of them is this image format. And we'll, although you can maybe look into the past and figure out how, where I stand on this matter, I'm going to leave it vague at this point exactly how I want to pronounce the name of that image format, just for history's sake, I guess. Um, so that image format uh, actually uses LZW for compression, and that's one reason, as we'll see in the next couple of slides, that there were some problems with this image format for a period of time in the 90s. If you wanted to encode this image format, you'd have to be a little bit creative where you went to look for tools because um, it turns out that LZW, when it was developed, so when Welch published the paper that is considered to have invented LZW, Welch was employed uh, in, I suppose, maybe a research position, but Welch was employed by a private corporation. And so Welch took out a software patent on LZW, and that software patent ended up assigned to Welch's employer, uh, which is pretty common. So those of you that end up in the private sector, you might discover that all of your intellectual property ends up assigned to your employer. Even stuff that you invent in your free time, in some cases, your employer can lay claim to as long as it's tangentially relevant to your job. Uh, I should add, those of you considering an academic career, if you're moping around about the prospects of academic work or the salaries or whatever, consider the fact that generally speaking, if you have an academic position, Position, they do let you keep your intellectual property, and even if they don't, they tend to be less likely to become patent trolls. They at least tend to. I don't know if that's the case at all universities, but generally Canadian ones are a little bit better about being patent trolls. Um, so it, because Welch held patents, uh, had held a patent on LZW, and actually it turns out that in the LZ scheme, uh, in, the, in the LZ family of compression schemes, um, LZW is descended from a particular LZ scheme called LZ78. And LZ78 was also patented by Lempel and Ziv. And they strangely apparently worked for the same private corporation as W, or the patent ended up owned by the same private corporation. So LZW and LZ78 were both patented, um, and the patents were owned by private corporations that were predictably a little bit litigious. And when, this be when it became clear that LZW was becoming popular, um, those corporations began sending people demand letters and things, and that meant that there was a bit of a chilling effect on the use of LZW. And as a result, LZW basically fell out of favor. And one of the reasons that was possible was by the time this became a thing, so LZW was used for a few years before the patent issue became a problem, but by the time the patent issue became a problem, other schemes had been invented, schemes like deflate. Deflate is also actually a Lempel-Ziv derived scheme with a bunch of other stuff thrown in. So it's not just Lempel-Ziv, there's a bunch of other things that it does afterwards, like entropy coding, which we'll talk about later. Um, deflate is based on something called, well, its distant ancestor is the original Lempel-Ziv scheme LZ77, and we'll talk about this in greater detail later in the course, but it turns out that Deflate's ancestry avoided the various patented LZ schemes that were causing trouble for LZW. That meant that once Deflate was invented, uh, it caught on because it's an it was achieving good compression, actually better compression typically than LZW, um, and by the time Deflate was invented, hardware had gotten good enough that although Deflate was a bit slower, hardware was faster, and Deflate had no patents, and therefore Deflate caught on. And that's how we ended up with GZIP, uh, in the early 90s, becoming such a ubiquitous tool on Unix platforms. Um, and it turns out Deflate is also used in the zip archive format, which is actually what inf Deflate was invented for, and Deflate is used deep down inside of PNG images. So if you use PNG image formats for anything, you are using Deflate. It turns out, interestingly, that Deflate is also used to uh, in the internals of PDF files in some places, uh, as is LZW, strangely. So PDF files support LZW compression, although I don't 
don't think that it's used by default in most PDF encoders. So deflate is used not just in gzip, but also it's buried inside of a lot of other formats that are in widespread use as well. So people that want to complain about deflate being out of date because they don't use .gz anymore um, don't necessarily have the whole picture. We'll talk about deflate a lot a lot later in this course. Um, and when I say that, I mean when it comes time to do assignment two, you can go ahead and look at the outline and see how much assignment two is worth. When it comes time to do assignment two, we'll be spending some time talking about deflate. Um, so because by the time um, deflate came around, LZW was falling out of favor, deflate sort of caught on. Now LZW's patent issues no longer exist. The patents expired in the early 2000s. Uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, there are no patents on LZW outstanding anywhere in the world that I am likely to be sued, and there haven't been for 20 years. Uh, and so uh, LZW can now be, is now in the clear. So if you wanted to, to design something to encode images of this particular image format, you can go right ahead and do so. There aren't any patent issues anymore. Um, so this lecture is going to talk about the Unix, the ancient Unix compressed tool, and how it uses LZW. It uses it in exactly the way that we used it in the last lecture, with one augmentation that we're going to sort of elide. We're going to try and avoid talking about that augmentation to the ex except to the extent that we sort of have to. We're not going to use that improvement. Um, I also want to talk about the binary format uh, that is used by the compressed tool to store the data. We know that we're going to represent symbols in bits, but how? How are we going to do it? Show me the bits. Uh, and we're going to see, I think, a couple of things, one of which this solving this dilemma of we've got this clever trick in theory, how are we going to see the advantage in practice? And I think, interestingly, that the Unix compressed tool is also sort of a microcosm of a bunch of other weird things that we tend to encounter if we dive into actual compression schemes, if we try and reverse engineer them. Uh, which is, you'll notice that there are a lot of things over this course in schemes like deflate or bzip2 and in this Unix compressed tool where the decisions seem arbitrary and they don't make very much sense and they don't seem to have aged well. And that ne isn't necessarily a theoretical problem with the compression technique. It's the fact that the designer of the scheme, especially for compression techniques in the past, was often one programmer who might have been a hobbyist, or they might have been somebody doing it as a side project, and they're just making random choices to get the code to work. And then once it works, as you know, because you're all programmers, once the code works, they don't bother going back and looking into whether they made good design decisions for some minor choices. And so we're stuck with those decisions in some cases, like in this case, almost 30 or 40 um, years later. Uh, we also notice that there are cases where even if the designer of the scheme notices later that they could have designed the scheme differently and gotten better compression, they're sort of stuck. They can't really change their scheme. In a lot of file formats that aren't compression oriented, so PDF is one of them, um, if we think about PDF documents, the PDF standard has undergone a lot of revisions. Uh, and there are also other, you could call them document formats, but schemes to mark up languages like HTML um, and programming languages like JavaScript or C or Java or whatever. But if we think about file formats or container formats like PDF, um, over time the PDF standard has changed and the format has been designed to be robust enough that if you're a PDF reader and you open a document that's too new for you, you have some way of figuring that out. The PDF um, container format has metadata in it to try and give you a hint as to whether the, the format has changed since, you, since PDF readers were designed uh, or whether you're using a, an extended version or something else, uh, some modified version of the format. Format. And the reason for that is because, like a lot of other container-based things, so um, PDF is one, but even a file system, things that are designed to be containers for data are designed with some degree of robustness to allow anybody using the container to know whether they're out of their depth. The problem is that takes up space. Uh, the metadata that PDFs use to tell the PDF reader what features they need, well, that takes up space. So if you design a compression format and you want to future-proof a little bit to allow the bitstream format to change over time and allow different versions of the compression tool to figure out what's going on, you have to add more overhead. And in the past, designers of schemes wouldn't do that. And so once the scheme is designed, they're sort of stuck with it because it's a compression scheme. Why would you add more overhead than you have to? Um, and then finally, implementing this scheme, the one in this lecture, so generating the bit sequences in this lecture, that's assignment one. And as I mentioned 
presumably by now in the live lectures, um, in assignment, the point of assignment one isn't so much design a compression scheme of your own, or even implement this compression scheme in a practical way such that you're making the right decisions. That's more of an assignment two thing. The point of assignment one is to make sure um, that you know the scope of low-level C programming you're going to have to do in this course. I, I, want there to, I want you to be able to ease in to that. And also, if you find yourself in over your head and want some time to prepare to do assignment two, I want that warning to come now so you have time to come and talk to me or whatever. Um, if you want to use the ancient Unix compress tool on a platform that has it installed, so although LZW and the, the bitstream used by this tool are still widely supported by archival tools like tar and whatever, um, the actual compress tool doesn't exist on every platform because, you know, who would be using it nowadays? It is installed on our common reference machine, so you can definitely use it there. You can install it on most modern Linux distributions. I, I was able to install it with no problem on my Linux machines. If you want to use it, you could use it like this. There are a few different ways of using it, but I strongly encourage that you get used to using it with piped input and output. So run the tool, pipe in via standard input, um, some, something to compress. It could be binary data, it could be text. In this case, I assume it's a text file. And then take the output and pipe it to some file. As I mentioned, customarily we use the dot uppercase Z extension for things that have been compressed with the ancient Unix compress tool. If you want to decompress, you can run the decompressor. Well, hey, the tool's called compress, so shouldn't the decompression tool be called decompress or uncompress? Well, yeah, it should, and it used to be. It used to be, if in ancient times, if you ran the ancient Unix compress tool, you would run the ancient Unix uncompress tool. However, on my machine at least, if I try and type uncompress, um, the operating system has aliased that to something else to a different decompressor. So we won't do that. If we have the ancient Unix compress tool, you can also achieve decompression with compress-d. That will be our canonical decompression command for the ancient Unix compress tool. Um, the reason why this is useful is for your assignment, we're, we're going to make a conscious effort to ensure that your assignment one is designed to produce identical output to this tool, uh, at least on small inputs. So if you want to check if your assignment is correct, I don't have to provide you any test data. You can just run the compress tool yourself and take a look at the output file. You could try generating a hex dump of this and then generate a hex dump of the output of your program. So I could do hex dump dash C is my preferred use of hex dump and then out dot uppercase Z. And that would generate a representation byte for byte of everything in the file. And on a small input, uh, your program for assignment one and the ancient compress tool should generate identical, byte for byte identical compressed representations. And of course, when you decompress, they should generate a decompressed representation that is byte for byte identical to the original input. Another advantage of doing it this way and requiring you to implement this actual scheme, byte for byte, is that if you want to decompress, you don't have to write a decompressor. If your compressor generates the same output as this, then you can decompress it with the provided decompressor. So there's also that. Um, it is possible to feed in just files via command line arguments to the compress tool. You can do that. Go right ahead and develop that habit if you want. Uh, I would rather that you not develop that habit because in this course, all of our assignments, um, up to a limit you'll notice at the very end where we have no other choice, but all of our assignments try to use piped input and output, and they'll be marked based on that. So if your program doesn't support input, um, and output via this convention, then you're in some trouble. So please maybe develop the habit of using only this input and output format to avoid there being any misunderstanding later. And yes, it's true that if you come in after the assignment gets marked and you've had a problem with that, I will refer you back to this point of this video. So minute 32 of this video is the canonical evidence that you were warned in advance that we are using piped input and output. And here's a slide that says that in case you're scrolling through the slides instead of watching this video. Um, in general, we strongly prefer, so even assignments or not, we prefer piped input and output. One reason is because it allows us a sort of um, a simulation of the streaming input and output that we want to achieve. For assignment one, to be clear, your program is absolutely required with no exceptions allowed. It is required to support input from standard input and output to standard output. So I should be able to pipe in input and get the output from standard output and pipe it to a file or, or whatever. I will not test your code in any other way. 
because I'm going to test it automatically. It is required for all of you to use the same format. It shouldn't be too big of a deal. Frankly, standard input is easier to read from than opening a file. You're saving a couple of lines of code, so I'm doing you a favor. But there's only one way, and it's this way. Um, so as we know, just to recap, a bunch of stuff from the previous couple of lectures that I talked about but didn't really formalize too much, compression schemes that use streaming data will produce, they'll, they'll take some stream of input bytes and produce some output bit stream, which is proportional to the size of the data, although it could be bigger for all we know, bigger or smaller, but hopefully smaller. Um, and the bit stream will typically involve some kind of other metadata. I've been using the term in the last couple of lectures, the term overhead, to refer to the extra data that compressors have to represent uh, in addition to the stream of bits that represents the actual symbols of um, compressed data. I've called that overhead. Overhead is sort of a judgmental term for one thing, but it's a subset of metadata in general. We'll actually notice that compression tools will typically add metadata that they don't really have to add. They will add a couple of bits of metadata just to, just to um, make it more convenient for anybody who encounters one of these files to figure out what's going on, or to perform basic diagnostics if they're writing their own decompressors, or if there's some kind of error correction problem or anything else. Um, as we saw in the last lecture, a compression scheme does not necessarily actually have to output binary data. Um, really, what LZW output in a theoretical sense in the last lecture was a symbol stream, a bunch of symbols that are just numbers. And how we encode the numbers is our business. Really, I mean, in, in some other strange parallel universe, we could take the symbols coming out of LZW, the exact same symbols, and instead of encoding them into binary, we encode them into ternary because maybe some weird event in geopolitics in the 1960s went differently and we ended up not with binary-based computers but ternary-based ones because indeed there were ternary computers that were built, in fact, designed and built around the 1950s and 60s in a different part of the world that never quite caught on. Um, so we don't necessarily have any investment in binary from the point of view of um, designing schemes on paper, but certainly we have an investment in binary in terms of writing code to generate compressed data on modern operating systems. Uh, and it is true there are a few schemes we'll see later in the course that we sort of need binary for them to make any sense. Um, so modern compression formats, uh, and I I'm going to use the term compression format broadly here, but if we think about dot uppercase Z or later dot GZ or dot BZ2 or in a loose sense dot zip, although dot zip isn't just a compression format, it's also an archive format. If we think about all of these, it turns out that the programs that generate files with these extensions, so compress or GZip or BZip, um, those programs will of course generate the compressed bitstream, but they will also include a bunch of extra data, not very much, but a bit of extra data, a bit of metadata in addition to the compression overhead. So the overhead that I've been talking about for the last couple of lectures is what extra data do we have to include in our stream to explain to the decompressor what we're up to. There is that, and schemes do have that, but there's also, um, because we're storing the result in a file, and what if somebody randomly ends up with a .gz file and has no idea what that is? How will they figure out what they're working with? What if somebody uses the wrong extension and uses .gz when they actually meant .uppercase z? Is there a way to figure out whether the file really is a .gz file or, and you know, besides decompressing it. If I try decompressing my file and the decompressor gives an error, does that mean the file is corrupt or maybe just that it's in the wrong format and I'm not um, using the right decompressor? Well, as a result, it's pretty common. Actually, I think the most common thing we'll see among these is this. Usually the beginning of a compressed file contains a couple of bytes called a magic number a special characteristic value that every file in that format has at the beginning. So that if you end up with a file in that format or you get a block of data from let's say disk recovery or something, you have some idea what format you're working with. Occasionally, compressed data formats include a bit of error correction or error detection um, to ensure durability. So if the file does end up getting corrupted, uh, that you have some way of detecting the corruption or maybe fixing it to some extent. And you might be asking, why are we adding error correction to compression? I mean, like, why, why would those two things go together? Compression is about saving space. Error correction, if you know anything about error correction, you probably know that error correction usually results in inflating the amount of space required. Keep in mind that one very common use um, of compression is for archival and backup. 
because we might make backups of our files or store them away because we no longer need them, but we might need them again later. Um, and when we do that, we want to save as much space as possible because our backups could be huge. It's very common for backup systems or archival systems to use some relatively fast, and so therefore not very good, compression scheme as a way of saving a bit of space in obvious cases. Because when you back up a disk, you can end up in some cases backing up files that are, you know, like two gigabytes of all zeros or something, because you never know what kinds of weird data people are storing. Applying some basic uh, gentle compression can help save space on a backup. Because we often design compression formats for the purpose of making archives and backups, it's pretty common for there to be this crossover use of, you know, since I'm making backups anyway, can I also do some error detection and correction on the way there? Um, for archival formats, so in this case things like .zip, it's pretty common for the archival format to contain bits of information to help us um, perform decompression selectively. So I don't necessarily want to extract every file from a zip archive every time I open the archive. I may just want to uh, extract some subset of files. And so in, in that, for that reason, zip archives contain data to tell me where does each file start and end. Um, and that allows me to only extract the parts that I want. It's pretty common also for, our, for compression formats to allow the storage of arbitrary text comments for some reason. Generally, people don't actually use that facility, but it's there. Um, occasionally, they store OS metadata, like what's the user who created this file? When was it created? When was it last modified? When we explore the gzip format in great detail, we'll notice that it has this. It, it, it's got the ability to store extra metadata as you see fit, although most compressors don't add that metadata because why would they? Um, so we'll talk about the extra metadata when we talk about the gzip format. The compress program, the ancient Unix compress program, does add a little bit of metadata. Um, the only non-essential thing is the magic number. So the beginning of every file, every .z file, is uh, going to be these two bytes. Because that way, if you encounter a .z file, or if you encounter a misnamed file, or you get a block of data from disk recovery, and you see these two bytes at the beginning, you could, let's say, in 2023 at least, you could look them up on the internet to say, hey, what kinds of files begin with a 0x1f9d? And that might you know, send you down the path towards figuring out what the file means. It also means if you're writing a decompressor uh, for this format, the .z format, and uh, you want to make sure that your user has provided you a legitimate compressed file, well, I mean, eventually you would probably discover the problem if you're looking at the compressed bitstream and it makes no sense. But if the first two bytes aren't 1f and 9d, you can give an error and say, sorry, I don't think this is a compressed file. So the magic number is a nice, easy error checking thing, and it does take up two extra bytes, but I guess we can throw away two bytes. So what about the symbols themselves? Um, compress, the compressed program is designed to encode anything. And we, we know that from the last lecture, we want to be able to encode sequences of any bytes. So any 8-bit sequence can appear in our input stream when we're encoding with LZW. And of course, the compressed program is trying to realize LZW. So the base set of symbols is every 8-bit value. Um, and that means that obviously we can expect we are compressing one byte symbols. We don't know that they're text or anything else. They're all 8-bit things and that our symbol table starts at index 256 because that's the first available thing after all of the 8-bit values have been added as single character symbols. Um, this is a review slide. Go ahead and pause the video and read it if you want. Um, so what I am doing, as I did in the last lecture, instead of representing each symbol by its numerical value, so uppercase A happens to be 65, not that we need to remember that in a course like this, what I'm choosing to do is when the output symbol happens to be a single character symbol, I'm just going to encode it with its, I'm going to write it down on my slide as its character value, not its numerical value, because the numerical value doesn't do very much for us. Of course, number 258 isn't a character value, so I'll represent it as a number in decimal. When we store these things, they're all going to get stored as zeros and ones. Um, the LZW scheme, as we saw in the last lecture, doesn't generate any metadata inherent to the compression stream. So there is a bit of metadata in the output of the compressed tool, and we'll talk about that at the very end of this lecture, and that's mostly to tell um, the decompressor things like how many bits are we going to use. Um, but the LZW symbol stream, so this, the output of LZW as we saw in the last lecture, contains no extra metadata. There is overhead in the form of storing symbols in more than 8 bits, but there's no extra bit 
of stuff that we send over at the beginning to tell the decompressor what's going on. That's one of, I think, the beautiful aspects of LZW, is that the decompressor figures out what's going on as it goes by reconstructing the symbol table uh, line by line using the compression logic. So the only real challenge we have here is finding a way of taking the compressed symbol stream and encoding it into a binary representation. And in our context, in this course, that means eight bits because we have to store it as bytes on disk. Now we sort of probably know how we're gonna get that to happen, which is we're gonna take our symbols, encode them in whatever number of bits we care about, break the resulting sequence of zeros and ones up into eight bit chunks, and then store those eight bit chunks on disk as bytes. So the first question, maybe we, this is an obvious one, can we store each of these symbols in eight bits? No. Well, obviously we can't because some of the symbols are numbers that are larger than what we can represent in eight bits. I can't store the number 260 as an eight bit value, sorry. So I guess I can't use eight bits per symbol. I hope we're not too disappointed because we probably figured that out at the beginning of the last lecture. Okay, fair enough, can't use eight. How many should we use? Should we use nine? Well, I mean, there's no clear answer because in a theoretical sense, at least on paper, this symbol table can just grow downwards forever. I could have symbols with index, you know, a million if I want to. Nothing about the theoretical approach we've taken to LCW forbids a symbol with an arbitrarily large value. Um, however, obviously, I want to use as few bits as I possibly can to encode my symbol stream. Um, so if the stream is long enough, we could end up with, well, we could end up with 2 to the 32 or 2 to the 64. We could end up with some horrendous number of symbols. We're limited only by basic things like what, what's the maximum um, amount of memory my program is allowed to use, or maybe more pragmatic concerns like if I'm writing a C program using local arrays, how big is my stack size, or something like that. Uh, and even that can be modified at runtime. There's ways around that. You can use dynamic allocation, whatever. I could have a symbol table as big as I want. That's not really my issue. My issue is how many bits do I use such that I don't overwhelm the decompressor with these massive bit strings for each symbol that are going to negate any compression advantage I have. Um, so one thing we should consider, an exercise you should consider for later, for let's say before a midterm, is uh, cons like if we assume our symbol table will just get bigger and bigger, um, we might want to ask questions like how many input bytes, like if my symbol table gets bigger as my input gets bigger, how many input bytes do I need to see at, at minimum before I get to a certain point in my symbol table? So for example, in the short inputs we've been working with, we noticed that even though this input only contains a couple of dozen characters, we do fill up a couple of dozen symbol table entries. Um, consider, I guess, solving the problem of how many input bytes do you need to get up to symbol index 300 if you start at 256? Um, the minimum number, but also maybe consider the maximum number. Um, how long can you go in an input before the symbol table reaches, let's say, symbol 260? Those are both things, questions that are worth considering. Um, we, for the time being though, we have to choose because we don't care what size our input is. We're assuming we're gonna work with inputs of any size. We have to choose some number of bits um, and therefore we can't have an unbounded symbol table size. Um, we have to maintain the symbol table in memory as the algorithm runs, even if we have some flexibility on number of bits. So what we're gonna see later is, I am allowed to choose, let's say nine bits at first, and then later I can use 10 bits, then 11, then 12. As long as the decompressor knows what's going on, I can use a different number of bits depending on where I am in my input. However, fundamentally, I'm gonna have to store my symbol table in memory. I don't know how big my memory is, but I can assume my memory is finite. I can assume that the size of memory doesn't change while the program is running. I don't think we're at the point where we're hot swapping memory. So because of that, I have to assume my symbol table does need some upper bound on its size. If I'm writing a compression and decompression tool that are intended to be portable, I should maybe hard code that limit. Uh, uh, and there are reasons I might not want to do that in some later scheme, but it's reasonable to assume there is some upper bound on how many symbols I can use. And for our purposes in this assignment and in this lecture, we're going to choose a pretty low bound. Um, 
And I should also add, of course, that I, the idea of an unbounded symbol table also contradicts our streaming assumption, because if our symbol table keeps getting bigger, we already know that LZW loves making new symbols. And so if we let it make as many symbols as it wants, then really our symbol table is growing in proportion to the input size. We don't know exactly how fast, but it is doing that um, in the worst case. And that means that we're not actually getting streaming data. We're not achieving our streaming requirement, because as the input gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and as we get to hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, I may eventually need a symbol table that's also hundreds of gigabytes in size. And that's a problem practically, but it also violates one of our core axioms in this course, which is I want to be able to stream through my compression scheme. So how about this? We have to pick a number. Let's pick a nice small number for now. Let's cap a symbol table size at 2 to the 16 entries, so about 65,000, give or take. That means each symbol index can be stored in 16 bits. Now you should look at this and observe that the first few symbol indices do not need 16 bits. They could be stored in less than 16 bits. But certainly, even if the symbol table is completely full, I could use 16 bits per symbol if I, use a, if I cap the symbol table size at 2 to the 16. Um, so this input contains 30 bytes and there are 21 symbols. Um, if we tried to use 16 bits for every single symbol, would we get compression? You can take a moment, I guess. Um, well, obviously not, because what I've done here is I've taken 30 symbols. They are currently stored in 8 bits per symbol, and I've done some clever tricks with them, and then stored, them, stored the result after using the clever tricks, I've stored the result in 16 bits per symbol. Now, I guess theoretically there's a way I could get such good LZW encoding that I do still save space, but we're sort of fighting a losing battle. We don't need 16 bits for this number of symbols when we're working with only you know 20 or so extra symbols on top of the base ones. Um, and if I use 16 bits, even if I were to save space for some reason, I'm wasting a lot of that space. I've got a bunch of zeros at the front of every expansion that I'm working with. So if I said my symbol table is capped at 2 to the 16, I don't know that I want to commit to using 16 bits per symbol right off the bat if I can avoid it. And this is one of those applied compromises that's a bit tough to see when you're just designing a scheme on paper. Until you see the zeros and ones, you don't realize not necessarily whether this compromise is necessary. Maybe you saw that one coming. You don't necessarily see the contours of how to make the compromise. What do we do here? Do we, do we split the difference and use 12 bits? Do I just limit my symbol table to be 2 to the 9 and, and just hope for the best? Well, none of those are really a good option. In this case, as I said, you only need 9 bits to represent this particular set of symbols for this particular input. But on the other hand, if I cap my symbol table size at 2 to the 9 for every input, then I'm going to be in some trouble because if I only have 256 possible symbols, to, to work with in my symbol table, and I'm, encrypt I'm, I'm encoding um, gigabytes of data, well, 256 possible symbols doesn't give me very many options. So I can't just limit the symbol table size to 512 and expect that I'm going to get good results. I need to split the difference somehow. I want lots of symbols to be available if I need them, but I don't want to incur overhead if I don't need them. If I only need 20 symbols, I don't want to use 16 bits per symbol. Uh, and I also should consider that the number of uh, symbols I need in my table is related to the, the size of the input, but not in an obvious way. So a particular input of a particular size may require, so consider an input of size 1000. Well, this input could require maybe um, 256 or 300 extra symbols, or it could require fewer for all I know. Um, I don't necessarily know the direct relationship, or maybe I can't even state, even if I did, uh, a direct relationship between input size and number of symbols that I need. Um, so the issue here is that I need some flexibility in choosing the size of my symbols, how many bits I use. The problem is, if I want to switch gears, so if I want to use 9 bits per symbol and then later switch to 10 bits per symbol, I have to be a bit careful because if the compressor makes that choice at random, arbitrarily, it has to tell the decompressor somehow. It has to add overhead to my stream to tell the decompressor, okay, shift gears, time to go up to 10 bits. So I want to try and leverage the same logic that LZW does. So LZW, as we saw last time, is able to give the decompressor a lot of information implicitly. 
the decompressor catches up to the compressor without the compressor having to tell it things explicitly. Um, I think that that's where we want to go with this because otherwise any rule that we use has to be somehow encoded into my compressed data stream, which means I'm adding overhead. The choice that I'm gonna make is, a, is effectively a rule that's hard coded into the decompressor. It's a, but it's the rule that's hard coded, not the specific time when the choice is made. So one really obvious way of doing this is to say, well, the first 1000 symbols are nine bits. And then the next 2000 symbols or something are 10 bits. And then the next 4000 are 11 bits in every possible input. That's not flexible enough because some inputs never need 10 bits. So why should I always uh, shift gears at the same location? If I do this scheme here where I shift gears at regular intervals, the decompressor can have that logic hard coded, but it's still not flexible enough. We're gonna see there is a solution that the Unix compress tool uses that does actually get the best of both worlds. It doesn't require the compression tool to encode into the input stream, into the compressed data stream, exactly when it's doing the shift between nine bits to 10 bits to 11 bits, but it does still allow the decompressor to figure that out by duplicating the compressor's logic. Um, so uh, the basic, I guess, intuition here is, okay, I might need lots of symbols. Maybe I need a thousand symbols. Maybe I need 5,000 symbols. Maybe I only need nine bits per symbol. Maybe I need 12. Maybe I need 16, who knows? But the symbol table fills up in an orderly fashion. So I start, no matter how many symbols I end up needing, I start with symbol 256, then 257. And I keep going until I hit symbol 511. Until I've hit symbol 511, until there is a symbol 511 in the symbol table, I will never use a symbol greater than 511, obviously. And that means that until I actually create symbol 511, I am guaranteed that every symbol that I use fits inside of nine bits. So I don't need 10 bits to store an index until I've used symbol number 512, which means the symbol table has size 513. Remember that symbol 512 in a zero-based table is the, is the 513th symbol. So I could consider that and realize that it, it, because the decompressor is able to reproduce the symbol table from the compressor, that's one of the hallmarks of LZW, one of the clever things about LZW, what I could do is have the compressor and decompressor agree that the number of bits we use at each step when we're encoding each symbol is proportional to the current size of the symbol table. So if the current symbol table only has, let's say, symbol 510 defined, that's the largest symbol index, then the compressor and decompressor both know, let's just use nine bits because I'll never need 10 bits to represent the number 510. On the other hand, if I finally create symbol number 512, well, num the value 512 needs 10 bits. I can't represent the, the decimal value 512 in nine bits if I also have to store zero, one, up to 256, all the way through 512. So if my symbol table has, contains a symbol that needs 10 bits, then we use 10 bits. And the trick here is because we're already assured that the decompressor can always recreate the symbol table from the compressor, even though in some cases there's a weird special case that we have to deal with, the decompressor always has the symbol table. That means the compressor and decompressor can agree on this scheme. We use nine bits until we need 10 bits. Then we use 10 bits until we need 11 bits. Once the symbol table is big enough to need 10 bits, then we have to use 10 bits or larger forever. The number of bits never goes back down again. It just keeps increasing as the symbol table size increases. So we use the following protocol. We start with nine bits because we assume very quickly into our encoding process, we're gonna need symbol 256 or 257 or whatever. That could happen very quickly. In the inputs we worked with in the last lecture, we were using symbols with nine bits like 256 or 257, maybe three or four characters in, in a couple of cases. Then we keep using nine bits until the end of the step where I fill in um, the last, the, the first element um, that requires more bits. So here I've got symbol zero, symbol one. I eventually fill in symbol 510. Then I fill in symbol 511. And at this point, both compressor and decompressor continue to use nine bits. At some point in the future, I eventually define a symbol 512 and 512 is two to the nine. Uh, and so this gets, there will be a symbol 512 added to my symbol table eventually. 
At some point down the road, I add symbol 512 to my symbol table. Um, and five, symbol 512 is only in the symbol table at the end of whatever step creates that symbol. So we know that at certain steps of the algorithm, the working string is sent to the, to the symbol table to create a new symbol. Until that symbol is physically there, I keep using 9 bits. So at the end of the step where symbol 512 is added, well, that's the first time when symbol 512 could potentially be used. So at the end of that step, that is when I increment the number of bits. So during that step, if I have to output something, I still use 9 bits. Because during the step where I create symbol 512, I will never use symbol 512. I just put it in the symbol table for later. So I don't increase the number of bits until the end of the encoding step where I create um, it, an index 2 to the power of the current number of bits. So in this case, number 512. Or much later, um, 2 to the 10 equals symbol 1024. At the end of that step, I increment the number of bits. And the idea is, when I, whatever num bits is sent to, that, whatever num bits is currently set to, that is the number of bits I use for whatever symbol I'm about to output. Um, additionally, in the compressed program, the number of bits is capped at 16. So once the symbol table is 2 to the 16 in size, we never increase the size again. That means if the symbol table fills up when it has size 2 to the 16, no new symbols get created. So if there's a step where I have a symbol to create, so here's a symbol, suppose I reach a step where this is supposed to be added to the symbol table. If the symbol table is full, if it has size 2 to the 16, then I just ignore this and don't add it and just clear the working string as usual, um, but don't add a new symbol. So I can never recycle this symbol later because it's not going to be in the table because the table is full. Um, now consider this. So allowing us to have our symbol table grow as we go, we start with 9 bits, then 10, then 11, all the way up to 16. Allowing us to do that means we can, we have flexibility to create a huge number of symbols if we need them, but aren't required to, um, you know, bear the weight of those extra symbols in the, in, in, the, in the form of extra bits if we don't need them. If our input is small, we can use a small number of bits. It's only if our input needs a large number of symbols that we begin using more bits. The problem is we still end up filling up our table. So after a while, our table of size 2 to the 16 is full. We're using 16 bits per symbol, and the symbol table has no more space. And that means if our input is truly massive, so if I'm trying to in, um, uh, compress something that is, I don't know, 2 to the 34 in size, so more or less um, several gigabytes in size, if I'm trying to do that, um, then I guess that's about 16 gigabytes or so. If I'm trying to encode something like that, then reasonably speaking, I should fill up my symbol table pretty quickly into that. If I'm encoding 16 gigabytes of data, maybe my symbol table is full after one gigabyte, and then it never changes again. So if I'm encoding 16 gigabytes, by the time I reach the end of that long file, my symbol table has been full for a very long time. No new symbols have been added. And we'll notice in this course that that's a bit of a problem. If we use LZ schemes, so LZ schemes are based on finding patterns in data and reusing them later, there is a certain benefit of recency, which is, generally speaking, if you want to use a pattern uh, again, odds are the patterns that are the most useful are ones that are more recent than others. So the further back, if, if I'm you know, here in my sequence, the further back I go in my sequence, the less likely I am, in general, to find patterns that are really helpful. Um, and one example of that, this is exploiting a pathological case. So this is not necessarily a typical input, but it illustrates our problem. Suppose that I make a list of all of the words in the English language separated by spaces. So I've got a, and then aardvark, and then a back, and then abacus, and so on. So every word in English in alphabetical order. And I try encoding that with LZW. Okay, so after I've encoded this little fragment, I've got a bunch of symbols. For example, the symbol a space. Okay, because I've got, and I, I do get to recycle, um, I guess I don't get to recycle a space, but the next one is space a, I get to recycle that a few times. So space a, so space a for aardvark, space a for a back, space a for abacus. And I think you can observe that if I have a long list of words that begins with all the words that start with the letter a, then the next one probably begins with the letter a as well. 
And that means I'm going to get to recycle symbol 257 a few times if I'm lucky. In this example, it actually only gets recycled once because of a, of a couple of other things that are going on. Um, just because the, uh, the space might get folded into some other symbol that gets used. So for example, um, the second occurrence of a space um, after I've created the symbol is here. But this gets captured as symbol 264, which is K space as opposed to space A. Um, but whatever, if I have the symbol space A, that might be useful early on in my list where I've got a bunch of words beginning with A after a space. The problem is there's going to come a point when the symbol space A becomes completely useless. When I reach the end of my list of words, well, at the end of my list of words, I've got a bunch of, I, I guess, the words beginning with Z. And so every time I see a space, it's going to be followed by Z. Will I ever use space A? Well, no, of course not. There are no more words beginning with A after the list of words beginning with A. Even once I get to the list of words beginning with B, I will never see a space A again. This symbol gets stale. It becomes useless, but it's still in the table. And so are a whole bunch of other symbols that also become useless. What about space AB? Well, once I've gotten past the words beginning with A, I'm never going to see space A, B again in this input sequence. But the symbol is still there, taking up space in my table, even though it's useless. That's one thing. It's one thing to have useless symbols. We saw last time, LZW creates lots of useless symbols. Um, it's another thing if the symbol table size is capped. If you have lots of useless symbols, but you can keep making more symbols, then you can keep benefiting from recycling symbols. But if you have a limit on the number of symbols, symbols become a lot more valuable. If I only have a certain number of symbols to work with, suddenly I get a lot more worried about wasting space on symbols that I know are never going to appear again. Symbols that haven't appeared in thousands and thousands of characters that may not ever appear again suddenly become a bit of a liability. So what do I do? Well, as I said, it's not actually an LZW problem. This is one of those things that is, this is one, one of those things that reflects that dilemma that we have of the stuff that we work out on paper versus show me the bitstream. So LZW works on this model of a symbol table that just goes on forever. I can just keep adding symbols forever. But when I cap the symbol table size, I'm in trouble because the symbols get stale. As I keep working through my input, the symbols in the table get older and older and I can't add new ones. And that means it's increasingly likely that the symbols aren't going to give me the compression that I want. Some of them might. Other patterns still might appear. BA might still appear in words beginning with X or Y or Z, but space A won't. And so the efficiency of the symbol table goes down over time. It turns out that there's no real fix to this fundamentally, because LZW is designed for a symbol table that increases in size forever. It's not actually a problem with LZW. It's a problem with this idea of capping the symbol table size. So the remedy we apply has to be on the order of what do we do in our compression tool to get around this? The Compress program has a remedy, a remedy that we are not going to use. I would like to use it, but the Compress tool has a sort of bug in it that makes the implementation of this remedy really difficult to reverse engineer. Um, so what happens is, basically, the Compress tool keeps track as it goes. As it generates the compressed data stream, the Compress tool keeps track of how much compression am I achieving? So what's the compression ratio looking like over the last, let's say, 1,000 or 100,000 bytes? Am I getting good compression? Am I using lots of symbols uh, that I've defined myself? Because if not, then I guess maybe the symbol table has become stale. Maybe some symbols have become useless. And the compress tool, when it detects this situation, when the compression ratio drops below a certain level, among other things, the compress tool says, OK, let's just start over again. Let's clear our entire symbol table and start and uh, start rebuilding it from scratch. So every now and then, it just flushes out the compressed data stream. Everything that's been compressed so far is fine. It uses the old symbol table. And then the compressed tool sends a special marker that says, please reset the symbol table. Let's start the LZW algorithm over again. Let's build up a fresh a set of symbols. So to do that, the compressor has to tell the decompressor, OK, time to flush the symbol table. It's time to reset and start fresh. And it does that with what I'm going to call a reset marker. Um, it's a term that I'm going to use a few times in this course. I'm going to call it a reset marker or an escape character. Uh, and this is a special symbol that is defined only for use of telling the decompressor, uh, flush the symbol table. And because it's a special symbol, the compressor needs some way of sending it. 
and it does that um, by using a special uh, entry of the table. So when the compress tool creates the symbol table, it actually reserves one entry for a special symbol that I'm gonna call the reset marker. And that means that um, LZW, all of, the symbol that, all of the symbols that LZW creates will now start one entry later. So previously, LZW symbols began at index 256 because we first have all of the one character symbols, zero through 255. None of those are available for use as the reset marker because all of them could occur in our data. So the compress tool reserves index 256 for the reset marker. If ever in our compressed data stream, symbol 256 appears, that is telling the decompressor to flush the symbol table and clear it and then start filling it again. So that's uh, the, the, the way that the compressor tells the decompressor to start from scratch. Um, that means that if you are trying to generate output that's consistent with the compress tool, you have to make sure that your LZW starts populating the table at index 257, not 256. Um, and I should also add that if the reset marker never appears, the symbol table never gets reset. So whether or not to reset the symbol table is strictly the decision of the compressor. The decompressor gets no say in the matter. The compressor can decide at any time it wants to reset the symbol table by sending over symbol 256. And when that happens, the symbol table gets flushed. The compressor could do that every thousand characters. It could do that at a time of its choosing. It could do that never. And if it never does it, then the symbol table just gets stale. And maybe that's for the better. Who knows? The compressor gets to decide. Now, I would like it if on assignment one, I could have you implement reset markers, because I think the idea of a reset marker is very important. It's actually a very general thing. So we'll see that in a lot of schemes, the idea of an escape character, a special symbol that has no other use than to tell the decompressor that something has changed in the compression state. Um, that's a very popular technique that's used all over the place. I really want to make you implement it, but I can't do that in assignment one. The reason that I can't do it is that although the Unix Compress tool does contain reset markers and it does use them, it uses them in a way that makes very little sense. That is, when it generates a reset marker, it does something weird with the binary encoding of the data. It does something, I guess, in the service of doing byte alignment. You could I, That seems to be why it does it. But it does something weird to the sequence of data that will give us all a headache. Um, and that's, I think, a bug. It's hard to know because it was almost 40 years ago that the tool was originally designed, but it appears to be that there was a bug in the way reset markers were implemented. That doesn't mean reset markers are broken. It just means it's very hard to recreate the logic ourselves. It, the, it, the logic is sort of arbitrary. The bug was in the original versions of the program. The program got distributed, which meant everybody was using it, which means everybody was generating these bit streams that had this weird bug in them. And that meant that they couldn't fix the bug because if they fixed the bug, then then the compressed bit streams people already generated would break. So they were sort of stuck with it. It was a bug that got promoted to feature because it was indispensable, right? It had, I guess it had the sort of the golden handcuffs or whatever it is. Uh, the bug couldn't be fired, and so we had to hire it on full time. Because of that, in our assignment, we are not going to use reset markers. And even if you find a way of making them work correctly, so you reverse engineer the bugs in the program and implement the bugs, those bugs into your own implementation, even if you get reset markers to work, you will not get any marks for having them, and you will lose marks for not following this instruction. So in our assignment, Assignment, do not include reset markers at all. Don't add reset markers to your bitstream at any time. However, because you are designing code to be consistent with the Unix Compress tool, you do still have to give the reset marker a place in the table. You're never going to use it, but you have to give it a place in the table. So when you write your assignment, your symbol tables will start at index 257, not index 256. And you'll never use index 256 because it's reserved for the reset marker. It actually turns out that in the decompressor, as we're going to see in a few minutes, there is a way of turning off reset markers. The problem is there's no way of turning them off in the compressor. So if we want to be able to diff the output of our assignment one um, uh, programs with the output of compress, we have to allow the compress tool to uh, you to put the reset marker in its table. Now, if we compress relatively small inputs with the compress tool, it won't use the reset marker, which means the output of the compress tool and the output of our assignment code should be identical. 
If we run a very long input through compress, it might generate reset markers, at which point um, the output of your assignment will be a little bit different than the output of the compress tool, so you couldn't do a one-for-one -one diff. You can still check whether your output is correct, because if you decompress it, it will still decompress with the regular decompressor. Because if you give the decompressor a stream where you never use reset markers, it'll be able to decompress it, as long as you have left index 256 reserved for the reset marker. Um, so what, what about the actual encoding process? So once I've generated my symbol stream, my LZW symbols, how do I turn that into a sequence of bytes? And spoiler alert, it turns out that it's not in the obvious way or even in the intuitive way. Um, I'll, I have added to the pseudocode for LZW an extra case to handle the situation where the symbol table is full. So um, the encoding process up to the point of getting actual bits um, is summarized by the pseudocode on the next slide. Um, the pseudocode takes into account the fact that our symbol tables are going to start at index 257 that is, leaving space for the reset marker. In other words, the pseudocode on, the, on uh, this slide here is in working order for you to use this for your assignment one. You can go ahead and use this pseudocode, and you might as well because you won't get this luxury on assignments two and three and four. Um, so we create a symbol table. Notice that in this symbol table, we make an entry for every single character symbol and just leave entry 256 blank, because you're never going to use it, but you have to leave it there so that um, you can start at symbol 257. There's symbol 257. And then otherwise, it's pretty similar to the pseudocode for LZW, except this and this. So this is the case where the table is full. If you've reached a step where you want to generate a new symbol, um, and you want to add a symbol to the table, uh, but you don't have any space in the table, what you do is uh, output the current working string as a symbol and then reset the working string, but don't add something, don't add the augmented string to the table like you would in a different case. The table's full, you can't add any new symbols. Now down here, in the case where we are adding stuff to the table, we run the risk uh, that we need more bits. So if I fill up uh, an entry of the table that requires more bits, uh, then we've reached that case I mentioned earlier where we have to increment the number of bits that we use. Uh, and so we have this if statement here to handle that. Uh, and as I said, if you use this pseudocode, you don't have to worry about when do you increment the number of bits because it's already being done by the pseudocode. And that might be helpful because it's then your problem to figure out how to turn the symbols that you're outputting. So output the index i. Well, that doesn't really tell us how are we out outputting zeros and ones. If I'm using 5 bits or 10 bits or 15 bits, what does it mean to output the index i? Well, remember that the symbol table indices are things like 256 or let's say the lowercase letter a, which is the number 97. When I say output the index i, I'm saying take that symbol and output it to your compressed bit stream. And that's the thing we're going to talk about next. So here's our very first input uh, from the last lecture, the word banana. And we went through step by step how to encode that using LZW. The version that we did in the last lecture encoded a little bit different. Um, it encoded to BAN257A. That was the version from the last lecture. I'm pointing this out to avoid people sending me emails saying there's an error in the slides. Nope, there isn't. There's just a nuance that we've just introduced. So in the last lecture, where our symbol table filled up starting at index 256, then we ended up with this encoding, where the first symbol that gets used was symbol 257. In this lecture, the version that I want to work with is um, this encoded version, which has been encoded as per the rules on the previous few slides, as per this pseudocode. Uh, in the pseudocode, we start filling in our symbol table at index 257. I think index 257 ends up being BA. Index 258 ends up being um, AN. And you'll notice um, that's sort of what we want here. We want this to be B-A-N-A-N-A. So it does say 258, and that is deliberate. That's because in this lecture, our symbol table starts filling up, not at index 256,
but it indexed 257. So this is two, this should say 258 here. Uh, and you may want to verify this. One, one thing I recommend when you're uh, implementing your assignment is, before you worry about the zeros and ones, first just print out the stream of symbols as individual things. Print them out as numerical values, print them out as characters, whatever. Make sure you're getting the same stream of symbols before worrying about what to do with the zeros and ones. Um, okay, so we have this stream of symbols in this version because it's only using a very small number of symbols. We only need nine bits per symbol, but we can benefit from having more symbols when the time comes. So if we need 10 bits, we'll use 10 bits per symbol. But until then, we'll just use nine. Um, the question then is, okay, so in this case, I've got a bunch of nine bit symbols, but I need to store them into eight bit bytes for storage because we're working on this, this idea of uh, the input is bytes, the output is bytes. Although we might have this arbitrary bit sequence in the meantime, we need bytes. Um, so we'll start with this. Here is the encoding from the previous slide. So each symbol and it's nine bit encoding. And you can satisfy yourself, this could be a 10 bit encoding, it could be an 11 bit encoding, it could even be a mixture of nine bit symbols. So suppose the first few were nine bits and the remainder were 10 bits. It would all work the same way. The process I'm about to describe works exactly the same way, no matter, I'll add a 10th bit to all these, no matter how many bits you have per symbol, you have this stream of bits that goes from left to right. And it goes, as you can see um, over here, we just view the very first bit as the first bit of the first symbol, where we interpret each symbol to be encoded into binary and nine bits in, I guess you could say, a big endian way, where this is the most significant digit of the binary representation. So I take this bit sequence, this stream of bits from left to right, I take it, here it is um, in the symbol stream over on this slide. I then uh, take each bit sequence, so each nine bit sequence, and I reverse the bit order. So that means this bit ends up down here, and this bit ends up down here. You can begin, if you want, screaming at the screen, why are we doing this? Don't worry, you'll have plenty, you'll, your voice is going to be hoarse by the time you're done. Um, why are we reversing the bit order? Well, we don't have a choice. The designer of the compress tool, um, see if you can dig them up. I'm sure that they, they retired probably 30 years ago. Maybe they're still somewhere retired. You can send them an email. I don't know. They made this choice. So we have all these bit sequences. In our mind, in my mind at least, because I'm the one making the slides, I visualize each symbol as being encoded into binary in a big Indian order. This is the most significant bit. And I also visualize the entire bit stream as being the concatenation of the representation of each symbol from left to right. It seems like the designer of the compress tool didn't think the same way. So for our purposes, we take the binary representation of each symbol in whatever number of bits it is. We then reverse the bit order. So we then encode the symbol in a little Indian fashion. So the least significant bit now comes first in the resulting sequence of bits. So the first step is, or I guess this is now called step two. Step two is reverse the bit order of each individual symbol. Okay, then we have this bit stream. So this is the real compressed bit stream, as far as we're concerned um, in, in the compress tool. It's this sequence of bits. Notice how I've removed the lines from between each uh, segment because it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. I don't care where one symbol ends and the next begins. That's the decompressor's problem later. When I'm compressing, I just create this sequence of bits. Okay, now I group that sequence of this bit stream, this abstract sequence of bits, I group it into 8-bit pieces. So the first 8-bit piece is this, the second 8-bit piece will be this zero here, and then the first few bits of this next thing. And so in any event, I group it into 8-bit pieces. Notice how when I perform the grouping, I could end up with the last group not containing 8 whole bits. Okay, so the next step is I pad out the last group until it is 8 bits. So at the end of step 5, I have a bunch of 8-bit chunks. Now, I, I know you're thinking, hey, great, I just saved these bytes to disk, right? Right? No, no, step 5 is not the last step, I'm afraid. We'll see whether you're pleasantly surprised by the last step. So I pad the last byte out. So now at the end of step 5, everything is 8 bits long. Then I reverse the bit order again. Okay, so that means that in this 8-bit uh, group I made in step 5, the least significant bit now becomes the most significant bit and vice versa. So I reverse the order inside of each little 8-bit segment. And then the bytes that I end up with, and go ahead and remember these or pull up the slides and keep track of the contents of slide 58. We're going to want them later to make sure that um, I'm not full of myself, to make sure that I've actually gotten this encoding correct. 
the resulting sequence of bytes, this is what we end up storing on disk or sending across the network or whatever. These are the bytes we send to the decompressor. So 62C2B8 111806. Okay, so obviously the question is, what is going on? What the hell is going on? Why don't we just take this, group it into 8-bit chunks, and call those our bytes? Uh, okay, there's a few answers here. I think I hedged my bets last time I taught this course. Um, I'll just go ahead and say it. I don't, I don't agree with this way of doing it. If I were designing the scheme, I would encode things differently. On the other hand, I have to be magnanimous and observe that maybe the reason it looks so convoluted has to do with my choices for visualizing it. So um, those of you that are familiar with the, um, the difference between big endian representation, and I shouldn't say those of you because all of you definitely are. That's a prerequisite to this course. You've all taken architecture. Um, there are lots of ways of representing numbers uh, in a computer. And you probably are familiar with the terms, I shouldn't, again, shouldn't say probably, you are familiar with the terms big endian and little endian. Most likely though, you're familiar with those terms in the context of, suppose I have a four byte value. So I have um, 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Suppose I have a four byte value in my computer's memory. How should I store it as four individual bytes? So if one word is four bytes in length, how should I store a word into memory? Well, there are two schools of thought. In the big Indian school of thought, you first, in, at the lowest memory address, you store 0x12, then, um, I'm just gonna do, we'll do 1, 2, then 3, 4, then 5, 6, then 7, 8. So the most significant byte of the four bytes, that comes first. In the little endian school of thought, you store the least significant byte, then the second least, um, then the third least, and then the most significant. Okay, so most of you uh, are probably more familiar with little endian and big endian in the context of how do I rearrange the bytes inside of a word. But the, and there are reasons why little endian versus big endian makes more sense on certain architectures due to the decisions made by the designers of architectures and whatever. Go take the architecture course again if you want to hear that whole thing. However, the whole big endian versus little endian dispute goes a lot further than that. And there are a lot of reasons why um, some people prefer when they talk about binary values that are stored. So binary in terms of just a stream of bits. So um, if I just think of an a, a abstract stream of bits, whether I should store the binary value 5 as 0101, which I would argue is sort of a big endian representation with the most significant bit first, so in 4 bits the number 5 is 0101, uh, or whether I should store it as 1010, which is little endian. This is the least significant bit. So there, there's even a dispute about what's the better storage mechanism for that. Now, Come to the office hours, I've got lots to say about this. I'm not gonna waste video time talking about this. What I will observe is, because I tend to like representing binary numbers on the page in a big Indian manner, so I like to represent this nine bit binary value with the most significant bit first, then I guess that means that for somebody that prefers the little Indian manner, this extra reversal step is needed. And the designer of the compressed tool apparently liked little Indian bit sequences. So I guess this reversal might be my fault. If you think of everything in a little Indian way, you wouldn't need to do this because you'd already have these in little Indian form. So at least one of these convoluted steps is sort of my fault. I'm, I, well, I don't want to, I'm a bit of a narcissist, so I'm not going to say it's my fault. It's everybody else, it's society's fault, really, um, for having a dispute like this. Um, but maybe it's a bit more convoluted than it would be in some other setting. On the other hand, I don't know about this. I feel like this extra reversal at the end is sort of kicking us while we're down. Once I have everything grouped into bytes, I've padded the last byte, let's just call this a byte. Um, the big Indian versus little Indian thing that we tend to worry about, which is the ordering of bytes inside a word, um, is a problem and it's something that we do have to, to consider very carefully for things like transmitting words over a network. So you might be familiar from a networking course with the idea that Generally speaking, we use big endian byte order for network transmitted data for the sake of having some convention. It's important to have a convention for that. There is no requirement that this reversal here actually happen because we're talking about the 
reversal of bits within a byte. And so if I'm sending everything on a byte basis, then it makes no difference how I chose to form those bytes because the bytes themselves are going to get preserved as I transmit them. So this reversal at the end does seem a bit pointless. Okay, whatever, I should be taking, up, taking this up with the inventor of the compress tool if I can track them or their descendants down. One way or the other, we're stuck with it. Um, we could also maybe cut that person some slack and say, hey, you know, they wrote this tool 35 years ago or whatever, and they distributed it, and maybe they wrote it in the course of a Friday afternoon or something. I mean, maybe they wrote it in 25 minutes, or they wrote this part of it in 25 minutes, and they weren't paying that much attention, or they used some a code snippet they were working on from something else, whatever, and then they were stuck with it, just like the reset marker bug. And once you're stuck with it, you can't go back. Oh, I mean, even if you want to, even if it was a mistake, everybody's using it. Now you've just got to live with your shame for the rest of your life. And, and people 35 years in the future make fun of you on videos and whatever. Um, we'll actually discover that this is an interesting sort of um, hallmark of a lot of other schemes. So even if this was a mistake, even if the designer of the scheme didn't need to do this, we're going to see in a few places in this semester that we work with compression schemes that are really good schemes that have that problem. So um, even really, really rigorously standardized things, so JPEG is one example that just has, there are just so many mind-numbingly boring documents uh, in the JPEG standard because of how well standardized it is, even those are full of features that in hindsight really could have been done better. But when they standardize, they're stuck with it. So we shouldn't blame the author that much for this. Maybe it's their fault. Maybe it's society's fault. I don't know. Um, but we'll notice that actually weird arbitrary decisions that haven't aged well are actually surprisingly common. So if you ever go to sign a compression scheme, you're probably going to have this problem too. And in 35 years, if I'm still around, I might be making fun of your compression scheme on a video for some future compression course, assuming I'm not replaced by AI by the end of this year. Um, so once we have that compressed bit stream, so, or I should say actually compressed byte stream now, here's my sequence of compressed bytes. All that remains is to package them together into the output format, which is our .z file. And as I said earlier, these output containers usually contain a bit of extra data to help anybody that encounters such a file figure out what to do with it. Um, the .z format contains a very small amount of header data, a very small amount of added metadata. All it is is a two-byte magic number, which is a constant value that's been chosen as a way of signaling this is a .z file, and a one-byte mode selector, which contains a little bit of meta information to tell the decompressor what settings the compressor was using. Um, and so the .z format is an example of a container format. And generally, our compressed byte streams like to live inside of a container format. We're going to spend a lot of time implementing an existing container format in assignment two, and then some time exploring our own containment uh, options in assignments three and four. So the magic number is uh, the two byte sequence 1f9d. Earlier, I wrote that as 0x1f9d, but I am now going to write it as two separate bytes, 1f and 9d. So the first byte is 0x1f, the second byte is 9d. I use the two single byte representations because we've had enough of the whole big endian versus little endian thing for today. These are two bytes in this order, 1f, 9d. And every .z file must begin with them. If it doesn't, the decompressor will just give an error and say, I'm not touching this. The mode byte is a sequence of bit flags uh, that give the decompressor a bit of basic information. So the most significant bit of the mode byte is whether or not reset markers are being used. Now, as I said, uh, we can actually turn this off. If we set the reset flag to zero, that means our symbol table starts at 256. The decompressor will work with a symbol table beginning at 256 if you set the mode selector to zero. And you might think, oh, great, that means we'll just to disable reset markers, because I know we're not supposed to use reset markers, Bill. To disable reset markers, I'm going to set this flag to zero. Um, not so fast. So we like the ability on assignment one for small inputs. So on an input small enough that the compressed tool doesn't use reset markers, we want the ability to use, let's say, diff or something to verify that the output of our compression program, our assignment one submission, exactly matches the output of the compressed tool. But the compressed tool always sets this to one. Whether it actually uses reset markers or not, it always enables reset markers. So for the sake of consistency with the tool, which is helping you because it's allowing you to test your code more conveniently, for the sake of consistency, in assignment one, you are required to set this bit to one, which means your symbol tables start filling in at, at 
uh, symbol 257. Symbol 256 is reserved for the reset marker. Um, the least significant five bits of the mode selector are the number of, uh, is, is actually a five bit value telling the decompressor how many bits you're going to use for symbol indices. So as I said earlier, we have decided to cap the symbol table at two to the 16 entries. So we'll use at most 16 bits. So you take the number 16 and you store it in this five bit sequence. That's the max bits. And it tells the decompressor the maximum size of the symbol table. You might look at this and say, hey, wait a minute, if that's a five bit number, couldn't I just set it to 11111 to use 31 bits? Nope, sorry, because the decompressor doesn't like that. The decompressor, for some reason, will reject any max bit value greater than 16. So although I would like it if we could use um, a, a symbol table size of 31 at most, because 31 bits is pretty huge. I would be able to get a lot of symbols in a 2 to 31, a table of that size. The decompressor won't do it. The decompressor will give you an error, It will, or the standard decompressor at least, will reject any value greater than 16. Because we want to use the standard decompressor, because I know you probably don't want to write your own decompressor, because we want to use this decompression command, we're sort of stuck with it. So on assignment one, you are required to use 16. That means that the mode byte will always be this. Um, the other two bits mean nothing. I guess they were defined, uh, they, they were left in there as a way of adding extra flags later, but there were no extra flags added. So that means that our mode byte uh, will always be exactly the same. So that would be, in this case, um, this, 4-bit segment is uh, 0x9, that's obviously 0x0, so our mode byte is going to be 0x90, always. In assignment 1, it must be 0x90. Uh, and if it's not, then we're going to have a problem with the marking. The compressed program with its default settings also uses this value. You can give it, I think, arguments that will um, change max bits or whatever, but we like 2 to the 16. That's not a very big number in 2023. Uh, so here is a sample run of my compressed tool on the input file from earlier. Whoops. Um, and uh, what I've done is I've created a file called banana.txt. I mentioned in an earlier lecture that uh, putting text in a text file to create input is a great idea, obviously, but you should look at the binary um, encoding of that file. Because sometimes, if you use a text editor, including the editors that I use, so when I use VS Code, it does this by default, editors like to add new lines to the end of your file. And so what you should do is do a hex dump of your input file to make sure it only contains the things you think it does. This input file contains six bytes, and there they are interpreted as ASCII text and as hex. So I know that it is just six bytes. Because if there was a hidden new line in there, which you might see in the form of a 0a or something, that hidden new line would of course change the compressed representation and you'd get output that makes no sense or doesn't match what you're expecting. So just to make sure that our input is what we think it is, I did a a hex dump, and indeed it is a six character file, B-A-N-A-N-A. -N -A -N -A. I then run my compress tool, so the Unix compress program, um, and you could try this on our reference platform. I run the compress tool, give it banana.txt, and store the result in encoded.uppercase z. I can then do a hex dump of the encoded file. So 0x, so the, the first bytes of the file are 1f9090. 1f9090. And if we go back a few slides, we realize that, well, the 1F9D, that would be our magic number. Okay, everything's looking good so far. Um, the uh, 0X90, that's our mode byte. Okay, so that means these three bytes here are the metadata that we just discussed. The remainder of the encoded file is 62C8B81806. Let's just take a ride backwards a few slides. Oh, there it is, 62C2B8111806. And we can see that is exactly the data that we had in our encoded representation. So that is proof that the encoding we've come up with, we've done enough error checking now to verify that the encoding scheme we've come up with does, on this small input of course, exactly match the ancient Unix compress tool. So that gives us some evidence that the ancient Unix compress tool is indeed an LZW compression tool and that it is doing the encoding even via this weird convoluted process where it's using nine bits per symbol and flipping bytes around constantly. Uh, it 
it is doing the same encoding that we think it is. Uh, and then we can decompress it just to be sure. So we take our encoded.z, we pipe it into compress-d, and then put the result in decoded.txt. We take a look at the result, and sure enough, byte for byte, exactly it matches the original input file. So we have achieved actual lossless compression on this input. Now, we call it compression, even though because of how small the input is, in fact, the result is actually larger. There are, there are more bytes. The result's nine bytes in size, even though our input was six. We should cut a little bit of slack because our input's only six characters long. With a longer input, we probably would actually realize some compression. Uh, and so in this course, of course, remember, before you begin worrying about debugging your compressed output, always do a hex dump of your input because you never know whether your text editor is throwing in all sorts of weird stuff that you weren't expecting. As I said, the most common thing is it throwing in a new line where you weren't expecting it. But there are also issues like if you paste in text, even from a slide, you might end up with a text editor using stylized quotation marks, which decode into strange Unicode characters that are more than one byte in size. So be careful about that. In this course, we spend a lot of time staring at hex dumps and hex editors to allow us to make sure that our input byte sequence is exactly what we think it is. Okay, so we've now seen both sides of the dilemma. We've seen the LZW scheme theoretically. We've seen the compromises we have to make to get it to work in practice through the lens of a real tool that was actually used near the dawn of time for compression um, utilities. Now, finally, now that we've got that context, we're finally ready to go through a set of basic techniques that we can use uh, and combine together and mix and match into compression schemes of our own, and that is how we're going to spend the next lecture.